Hi, this is Scott Ware of Radiance Multidimensional Media and Radiance Magazine, which is found at 660 conscious locations in Southern California and online at radiancemm.com. And I have with me Dr. Greg Reed. And welcome, doctor. Hey there. Can I call you Greg? Is that okay? I wish you would. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, Dr. Greg Reed is a world-renowned speaker, filmmaker, and entrepreneur. He has published, co-authored, and featured in more than 100 books and five motion pictures, including Wishman, about the founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and Three Feet from Gold, which we'll be talking about specifically. He's also the founder and CEO of The Secret Knock, an event and professional collaboration community focused on partnership, networking, and business development. That's quite a bit. You've been very busy, I don't know, the last few years at least. There you go, and the crowds go wild. You know what's the crazy <laughs> thing about the books is that I can't really read, write, I'm dyslexic, uh, I can't spell, play me words with friends, you'll win every time, <laughs> yet I'm this prolific author by one simple little thing. I learned a great message a mentor taught me, he said, work your strengths and hire your weaknesses. So yes. I'm still a, you know, BS, I'm a good talker, right? So what I did is I got these great ghost writers who could take my words and craft them in a way people would read them, and here we are today. Very nice. And I also hear this has all earned you a star somewhere in a, in a sidewalk. How, how does that work? Isn't that crazy? So right above me here, check this out. Oh, yeah. So on the Vegas Strip, right in front of the uh, Paris Hotel at the base of the Eiffel Tower, I've got a star on the Walk of Fame. I'm only six away from Elvis Presley. <laughs> all things. How crazy is that? That is crazy. Very nice. So you are a, I, I want to call you a success coach. Would that be right? I've never actually coached anyone in my entire life, as crazy as it is. Uh, I'm an author, speaker, filmmaker, run about six different corporations around the United States and Canada. And the whole idea is, again, is I work what I'm really good at, and then I find amazing people to collaborate and let them go work their strengths. Okay. So if people are inspired by you, as they may already be, and um, want more information on you, for, for one thing, where would they go? Google, just Google my name, Greg S. Reed, you'll find me. Uh, the easiest way to connect though is Instagram. Just go to Greg S. Reed and send me a direct message. It goes directly to my cell phone and I'll respond uh, right to you. Okay. Now I saw uh, the trailer. I didn't see the movie yet, but I saw the trailer for a wish man about the creator of the make a wish foundation. And that's, it was very inspiring. I mean, that must've been a labor of love for you. Oh, absolutely. It was interesting. I was interviewing Frank Shankwitz founder of Make-A-Wish uh, for a book I was writing called Think and Grow Rich, Stickability, The Power to Persevere. And at the end of the interview, I go, Frank, I got to know, what was your wish? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, you're the founder of Make-A-Wish. What did you want? And he says, no one ever asked me. I, said, <laughs> I go, I'll be the guy that grants your wish. Anything you want, I will give it to you. And he says, I just want my story to be told so my grandkids will know I did something cool. So it took six years, millions of dollars, and I found a way to make it come to fruition, so much so that we made the final uh, ballad for the Oscars this last season. We didn't get the nomination, obviously, but we made the ballad, and we're trending on uh, worldwide on Netflix right now. That's beautiful. Where, where can people find this movie to watch it? Go to Netflix right now. Tune in, pop it in. Here's the, what it looks like on the cover there. And uh, just uh, watch it for free tonight and stream it with your family. Just make sure you got some uh, tissues handy because you will be crying. <laughs> nice. So what was it about him that inspired you so much? Uh, you know, I'm sure there was a correlation between your story and his. A little bit. A lot of it is just granting other people's wishes. That's one of my favorite things in the world to do. In fact, I just hit my uh, bucket list of all 80 items I want to do before I died. And rather than add more, I went to my son who's seven, old seven, and said, what do you want? And I'm starting to knock those things off. I found that we get more goals and dreams than we ever do ourselves. And for Frank, he was a selfless human being. And I realized that everyone can be a hero. You don't need to be a millionaire or billionaire to make a positive impact. You can give a pair of socks to a homeless guy or stop a bully from fighting. And I yeah. want his story to be shared with the world. You know, when, when I was researching you and then we did a little, uh, had a little conversation, I found you, you ran with the bulls in Paloma and you've, you've done some, uh, some outrageous stuff. And it's not that everyone has to run with the bulls, but what, what kind of people are you looking to motivate or what, what, what are you looking to do in the world? What's your mission? 
mine is just to live the greatest life that I can live. My job isn't to fix anyone or to tell people what they should do. I like to live by example rather than promotion. And I happen to be 32 years sober guy. And so it's really cool. Is that is the motto. And that's mm. the way that I live my entire existence. So what happens is I got a pretty cool life, to be honest with you. But it was self, you know, directed over many, many years of trials and tribulations. And now people come up and they say, hey, how can I do that for myself? And then I can share some words of wisdom rather than me project what they should do. And what are the words of wisdom you've been giving out most often lately? Seek counsel and not opinion. That's my biggest one. I mean, opinion is based on ignorance, lack of knowledge, inexperience, like all your family, friends that have never done what you want to venture upon. Counsel is based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship, people have paved the way. So if I go to a family friend and say, I'm going to start a business or write a book, they might talk me out of it if they've never started a business or written a book. But yes. If I go to Jack Canfield who wrote Chicken Soup, he'll say, Greg, before you get started, here's what you need to know. Give me counsel based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship. If we would spend our activity only seeking counsel and ignoring opinion, that's the day our life would change. You know, I got a phone call the other day from someone who was interested in doing photography for the magazine, and I, I didn't have a, a role to fill for her, but there was maybe something else we could do together. There was an opportunity, and uh, but she just picked up the phone and called me, and I'm surprised at how few people actually do that. And and. I'm not, you know, Jack Cornfield, but I mean, that's true, right? A lot of these people just pick up their phone if you call them. Well, the most successful people are also the most available people. And I know it's weird, but it's true. If you're brand new at something, you're happy, go lucky, you're fresh, you're cool. If you're at the top of your field, you're happy, go lucky, you got nothing to prove. In the middle, pain in the neck. You're yeah. building ego, you're edging God out, you're finding your own voice. Ah. It's easier to get to the founder of Remax Real Estate Billion Dollar Corporation than your local Remax office down the street because he's got six different people screening the calls and driving the BMW. So I realize you jump to the front of the line to get what you want. You said edging God out, and I know that's an acronym for ego. How does that play into your success formula? Very much so. So I'm a very spiritual based human being. Again, though, I don't project that on other people. It's just the way that I live my life. And you and I are having a friendly conversation. It was interesting because it keeps popping up. And some people mm -hmm. call it God, universe, and without judgment, I mm -hmm. do realize this. And you and I had this uh, little debate, I guess, so to speak, in a friendly way. We said, what if mm -hmm. God in the universe granted every wish, every prayer we ever asked for, but we didn't like the packaging, so we sent it on its way. Yeah. For example, if I said, God, I need a hundred bucks, please, a hundred bucks. Guy pulls up in a truck, aluminum can, says, take these off my hands, are worth a hundred bucks. He said, I don't want those stinky things. You asked and you prayed. It was delivered, but you didn't like the packaging. So you That's right. Away. Well, that tells the universe or God that you don't appreciate and have gratitude for what is delivered. And that's where we say, be careful what you ask for, because you might just get it. And the most successful people I happen to interview and run course with, we realize when we throw it out, we get out of God's way and let it come to us the way that it's destined for rather than we expect it. And it's been my experience when those cans get delivered, the route or the, the path to get those cashed in is frequently where you'll meet other people or come across <laughs> other situations that really take you where you need to go. Absolutely. It's a, one thing leads to another. I believe in not the beaten path. For example, I, you know, we have this whole reticular activator system, right? And if I'm going to go to the grocery store, I do my very best not to go the exact same way to the grocery store every time. Because as soon as I go to a new street that I've never been, I see things differently, a new house that I never saw. And it right. sparks ideas and inspiration for me. So I'm a big fan of not doing the same thing over and over. So your book, Three Feet from Gold, I'm, I'm familiar with that phrase. I've seen the memes on Facebook, things like most people give up not knowing that they're actually digging for gold and they're just three feet from that vein. Is, it, is that what you're referring to? Well, that's the actual book I wrote. So Napoleon Hill, 08 gained access to the richest man in the world, Andrew Carnegie, and he was given a letter of introduction go meet all of his friends and write the first ever formula for success and wrote Think and Grow Rich, the 20th best selling book in history. A mm -hmm. hundred years later to the date, the Napoleon Hill family, a surviving family and the foundation gave me a very similar letter. And basically I got a Willy Wonka ticket to meet any human alive. 
and I sat people down around the globe to find out exactly what they did. And I've been writing the Think and Grow Rich series through the Napoleon Hill Foundation for the last 12 years. And the first book we did was called Three Feet from Gold, which is being re-released in March. And I got to tell you, it went to 45 languages the first year. It is spectacular because I got to sit down with amazing minds of today's generation to find out exactly what they did to separate themselves from everyone that dreams of success to the top 5% who actually do it. What are some things that the average person just doesn't seem willing to do to reach their dreams? What are you finding there? Well, one, they have something called the bad case of the one size. That means I'll take action once I get the kids out of the house or once I get them uh, to the break. But the right. biggest time to take action is when you get off your big butt. And it's not the one you're sitting on. But everyone sits there and says, I'd go do that. And it's that butt that stops them. And I realize that's a common denominator. You're scared. I'm scared. We're all scared. Successful people do it every way. And the common denominator is this. There's a bumper sticker at Disneyland that says, what would you do if you couldn't fail? And the big question is, what would you do if you stopped giving a shit what people thought? As soon as you stop living in judgment and fear of judgment, that's where all the opportunities lay on the other side. So they might, people might say, yeah, Greg Reed, wait, he's, just, he's different though. He's made of different uh, material. I don't know, for me, I'm so used to saying, but I've just been saying all the time, how, how can those people nudge themselves that, that little bit? First of all, again, it's not my job to change them. I'm not a psychologist. And if they choose to stay in that way, they choose to stay in that way. But the few of this people that are listening to this going, hey, that's me. I'm ready for that next step. I'm willing to take yep. actions. Come talk to me. I'm your guy. But I promise you, I will not attempt to change anybody to do something that they don't want to. Of course, of course. Um, now, when you talk about calling a mentor, I, I don't know if we use that word yet, but that's what you meant, like getting counsel. Mm -hmm. How does that work? What should you think of? Just reach for, hi, whoever's the top person in your field and just reach out to them. Has that been your experience? Yeah, here's a simple little phrase. Surround yourself with people you have respect for, not people you have influence over. That's it. Surround mm. yourself with people you have respect for, not people you have influence over. And here's very important. Have many mentors. Look, I got a great tennis mentor that works on my backhand, but I don't ask them about financial advice. Mm. And I don't ask my accountant about my writing, and I don't ask my speaking coach about my movie career. So what I do is I have multiple coaches that are the world authorities in each one of their crafts. And you're living the life you want to live. You're making movies, you're writing books, you're hanging with top people in the world. You're a testament to this. Just the life that I chose to live for myself. And, you know, what's really interesting is that, you know, there's a word that we got to add to that whole thing about surround yourself with people that are getting the results you want for yourself today. And I'll give you an example. I got a great mentor of mine who started Chuck E. Cheese. That was 40 years ago. So if I was going to order, you know, start a new uh, fast food, real, you know, restaurant chain, I probably wouldn't ask that character how to do it. I'd go to Five Guys or In-N-Out, something that's trendy today. And yes. that's very important to understand. When I wanted to be a best-selling author, I went to Barnes & Noble. I bought every best-selling book. I didn't want to be a great writing author. I didn't care about that. I just want to be a best-selling author. And I asked those people how they did it, how the hook goes, what's the system. And I mm -hmm. followed it, and here we are. Same thing when I went to Africa and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I did not ask a dope-smoking surfer here in La Jolla to take me up to the roof of Africa. I found the Sherpa that I climbed it 900 times. Wherever they put a boot print, I put my boot print. I followed successful actions. And I realized we get up everything we want as long as we're willing to do that. And it's just as a small percentage of people that believe they're worth picking up the phone and calling that person. Well, you know what comes down to how you can get through these things is specificity. Mm -hmm. And it's the strangest thing, but less is more. I'll give you that whole thing. Cause remember everyone watching this, you don't know who I am. You've never seen me before a day in life. And the people I called to interview, they've never heard of me and they don't know me either. So let's be very clear on that. But the way I get through the door is specificity. I will call up somebody, I'll see the guy who's creating string theory or whatever, the president of NASCAR, and I'll reach out to them and say, I need 12.5 minutes of your time. I'm working on a book called Stickability or Three Feet from Gold. I mean, by the time I walk in, the time I leave, I only ask you one question, why didn't you quit before the miracle happened? That's mm. it. And all of a sudden the chance of me, them giving me that time goes through the roof. But unfortunately, a lot of people call you up and say, hey, can I take you to lunch and pick your brain and take you to dinner? I don't know you. So the chances are I'm going to say no to that. But if everyone calls me up with specificity that I only need 12.5 minutes, this is what we're going to do. That's like 99.9%.
that's all we got to do. Some of these things seem like common sense or we've heard them before, but we really need to be reminded because we fall into old habits, old reasons of why we can't do things. So that's why I think what you're saying is actually very fresh. Well, what's really amazing to me is how many people want to come up to me and make me work for them. I'll give you an example. Someone will come up and they mean the nicest of intention, by the way. But here's how it really goes down. They come up, I'll get off stage and go, hey, how, I want to work with you. What can I do to be of service to you? Again, I don't know who you are. I don't know what your skill set. I don't. So now I got to go through a whole interview process. Just to, it's a waste of my time. But if someone comes up to me after saying, "God, I love you. I want to do some work with you. I see you're on Instagram. Hey, do you mind if I make you two free memes that you can use? And if you like it, maybe you can hire me down the road." Heck yeah, it's easy. So when I go to people, I make it easy for people to work with me. That makes sense. Okay. So it's putting themselves in your shoes. What could you, and that's what, a, in, if, especially if you're in sales or an entrepreneur, you need to ask yourself, what does my customer want that I'm trying to sell to? Correct. And how do you open up the doors of opportunity? Mm. Most people are afraid to do those things because again, they're not willing to do something today. So they have a brighter tomorrow. I have a domain that says, uh, be kind to your future self.com. And all it means is, look, if I want to be 20 pounds lighter in five months from now, I got to put the cheeseburger down today, be kind to myself today, so I'm, I'm kind to myself in the future. It's not rocket scientists, the type of stuff. It's just the delayed gratification, and that's what successful people do. That book behind you, Stickability, I think of a couple things. I think of, okay, you know, just do it and stick with it, but is part of it also like falling in love with what you do and what you love? Some people might say yes, some people might say no, but the majority of the people that have had the greatest success in the world actually don't have that philosophy. What they do is they look for and capitalize on unexpected opportunity. Mm. But stickability means I want to get to the end of the street, and that's my goal and destination. Nothing's going to stop me. But a planner and a passion-filled person is going to plan every step where they're going to pause and take a break once they get off the sofa. I'm looking, hey, did a kid leave a skateboard or a bicycle out to make my journey short? I'll hitch a ride by a neighbor driving by, get to the end of the street. Either way, I got stickability. I'll get to my goal. I'm just not so caught up in exactly how it has to happen. I like, I agree with that. Um, what about the role of intuition being in the flow? Because even if, you, if you're in the flow and you're really in command of, of your game, doesn't that take, a, you know, that, then the skateboard's just going to appear for you? Well, nothing magically appears for anybody. It's just reticular activator. It's Rumi said, whatever you seek is seeking you. Yes. Everything's already there. When teacher's ready, a teacher appears, right? So, I mean, we've done all the cliche stuff to death. So, it's already out there. All we got to do is look for it. And that's the way it is. Right now in the universe, let me tell you, there's country music, rap music, classical in the airways right now around both of us. But if I took a receiver, dialed into an exact frequency, I could pull it down and enjoy it. That's exactly. the same thing. Health, wellness, relationship, everything's around us too. But you tune into it, you dial it by the questions in which you ask. And this gets a little wooey, but here's my truth. I do a thing called access consciousness. And I believe it's the specificity of the questions that we ask is the tuning mechanism. So I say, how can it get better than this? How can I see a solution in a challenge that I might not be observing right now? And all of a sudden, those things magically appear. If I sat there and said men's shoes, like on Google, there'd be a billion, you know, results. But if I said men's shoes, size 10, red color within a one mile radius, it's very specific. And I think the more specific we can be for our questions that we ask the universe, we can be uh, given those answers that are exactly what we're looking for. You talk about that kind of tuning. It sounds like the next title, the title of your next book is going to be the success frequency. Yeah, we did something called a success equation with that same concept. And, you know, it's interesting when Michael uh, Jackson was interviewed and he did Thriller, they, he said, you know, well, tell me the story. He says, well, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, had this idea, and I did not sleep for days until I could get every word and syllable out of my head. And he says, well, why'd you do that? He says, well, I didn't want Prince to get there first. And the idea is that all of it's out there, but certain people, it's called tapping the source. Yes. That's why at three o'clock in the morning, you wake up with the our idea time to brush your teeth it's gone you see a billboard 10 years later and there's your idea certain people took action look bob proctor and i did a book together called thoughts are things and we mm. realized that thoughts are not things. it's mm. thoughts backed by action become things period 
Explain that a little bit uh, and how that can make someone more successful as opposed to someone who didn't know that. Well, think about it. The fact of the matter is by science, and everyone can Google this or look it up, by Harvard professors have proven that we have 64,000 thoughts a day. Majority of those thoughts are negative. They're called ants, automatic negative thoughts. They're there, <laughs> they're a trillion part of your brain to protect you. So when you walked out of the cave, a dinosaur didn't eat you. Well, if we had 64 thoughts a day, a majority of them are negative, then everything should be shit and chaotic around us, but it's not because it's only the thoughts that we back action by become our realities. If thoughts were things, right this second, I'd be a slice of pizza, <laughs> right? But <laughs> right. when we're done and I go to Luigi's to buy a slice of pizza, my thoughts become reality by the actions in which we take. So it's what we focus on that matters regardless of the ticker tape running through, it's just what we focus on. But and act on. Fleeting, yeah, but sometimes those are fleeting thoughts too. So I, I don't even know if that's true because the whole thing is you could sit there and think Every, every time you get in the car and you're in traffic for two hours, every time someone cuts you in front of you and you're late to get home and you're going to bump them or hit them or whatever, it doesn't mean you do it. So if your thoughts were what you focused on, again, it would be horrible. It's only the actions in which you take those thoughts on. The actions that are inspired by the thoughts that empower you the most. There you go. Okay. And that are in alignment with your mission. Now, when someone has decided to make this their stickable um, they're going to stick with this. They're going to focus on this. Uh, I imagine it's much better when it's also their life mission. Do you find that people have a life mission and just getting alignment with that is uh, a higher calling? Look, this is where I, I, we're going to have some challenge, I guess, because if you read all of my previous books, I would have gone with you down that rabbit hole and done the success equation and follow your purpose and passion. But I also then did another one called Wealth Made Easy. And when it comes to wealth and prosperity, mm -hmm. 100%, I don't agree to that. Okay. Living a purpose-filled life, like a nurse or a politician or someone that's doing what they truly love, absolutely, you are correct. But at the end of the day, the majority of the people that have the greatest success, they didn't follow their passion. They didn't follow any of that stuff. It's one of the greatest lies that ever told. And that's what holds and suppresses mankind. Because if you look at those memes, they say, follow your passion, not a paycheck. And then you wonder why you're freaking broke because you're being taught this BS message. So the real reality is, is you look for and capitalize on unexpected opportunity. You build up so much wealth and prosperity with that, that you use that to finance your passion. I, and, and I agree. Yeah, people have that side passion, that little thing. But, but I, I, it just seems to me that that thing you find, that, that gap you fill, a need that you fulfill that's profitable and, and you go after it, that you chose that one and you saw that one would seem to me that there's a passion as opposed to the 10 other things you saw. You saw this one, I feel, because you and you, you go could, after it. You could, you could do that all day long. But again, I just hang out with the, the, the billionaires of the world that control oh. everything. And none sure. of them did that. They, they created cardboard boxes. You're telling me without any BS that the Gettys that built America or the sheiks in the, uh, the deserts, they have passion for crude oil under their feet? You're telling me that waste management has passion for dirty diapers and rotten cheese. You're telling me that aggregate dealers have passion for crude, you know, for aggregates that built the freeways and roads, but they built every Coliseum. They built the arts, the ballet, everything we know and love. So I don't, I can't go with you. I mean, the real reality oh. is the people that have created the juggernaut of juggernauts of things, the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos right now created Amazon only because he wanted to sell books online and he saw there was a niche and he filled it and became what it is today. But if you go back and look at his earliest interviews, a hundred percent, there was no passion. It's the, it was, they saw an opportunity, they filled it, but now the guy just donated $10 billion to solve, you know, the uh, climate change. So yeah. the reality are, is that you work your opportunities to create wealth and prosperity to finance your passion. But see, I see passion. I see it's wonderful. Waste management, I think, is wonderful. I think that that is a wonderful thing that we need in society. And that someone is managing that, I think, is great. And someone is getting us the things we need at a moment's notice at our doorstep. I, I don't know. I, 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 I suspect they have a passion for that in their own way. I could be wrong. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, it's the viewpoint. I totally understand. I just think if you go back and you look at everything that really controls oh. society. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, and you've interviewed all these people. I haven't. So that's, you've got that, that perspective of the most successful people. So um, I should probably read your book and I'm sure I, I would learn a few things. Well, all I'm saying is this, these people that I talk to, they're going, look, we own the football teams and the coliseums that are building all the real wealth of the world. It goes while well, people following their passion are literally giving their bones and blood on the field for a few million bucks. He goes, we'll do that trade all day. And if you go back and start looking at some of the most incredible things that we think are people following their passions compared to people that found their opportunities, it's just a different perspective. Like I said, yeah. look, if you want to be a nurse again, or if you want to be an author, or if you want to be a biotech guy and that's your passion, a hundred percent read my books about the success equation because it teaches you how to find that purpose-filled life. But I'm talking about wealth and prosperity. It just doesn't fall the same way. Well, and I know a lot of people out there that are in jobs they don't like making whatever kind of money would rather be in that situation, would rather be in wealth, uh, fulfilling some need. They just haven't applied themselves and haven't figured out a way to do that, but possibly, you know, be, would be motivated by reading your book to do that and get out of that kind of cubicle drone job they may not like. Well, there you go. I would agree with that one as well. Look at all this light in my face. It looks all like foreign over here. It's cool. Yeah, you look great. <laughs> But yeah, so that's, that's why I think the people would be inspired. So, um, and, and there would be some, I don't know, to me, I, I love solving problems. And I think people would like, if, if they see a problem that needs to be filled and uh, that there's, there's just something fun about doing that. And if you can get wealthy doing it even better. I agree with you again, but usually what I'm just telling you is that mm -hmm. the fun part comes from the business side of it. Yes. Yeah. Not from the thing. Again, if you look at <laughs> zippers, or my other mentor who created Velcro for the world, there's these opportunities that just fill the void that it was ready at the right time and right you know, place, but it went on to impact the society as a whole. So let's move on to the next uh, topic because we can do that one all day. Absolutely. Um, so that other book behind you, uh, which one is that the, um, on the other, yeah. Well, this one's Success and Something Greater. This is the last title that Napoleon Hill was going to publish before he died and never got a chance. So oh. Aaron Lecter and I just did this book. It just got released a couple months ago worldwide. That's Wealth Made Easy. But back to this stickability, what's kind of cool is the first person I interviewed for that was a guy named Marty Cooper, and he invented this the cell phone. Ah, okay. And I asked him a question. I go, what does stickability mean to you? And he said, stickability has to be parallel with flexibility. He says, if you're not willing to adapt and adjust, you get stuck. And he told this story about a spider monkey. He said, in the rainforest, a spider monkey is so quick and nimble, you can't catch it, harpoon it, it's too wiry. But one hunter named San Juan figured it out. He took a heavy log, drilled a tiny hole, dropped a peanut inside, left at the base of the jungle. The monkey smelled the nut, reached his hand in, grabbed a hold of the nut, and his fist becomes so big, he can't pull it back out and become anchored to the log. The hunter comes by an hour later, captures this elusive spider monkey. Now, all he's got to do is let go, but he thinks that nut is nutrition, so he holds on with dear life. Right. The question is, are we holding on to our own nut in life right now? But it could be in the form of a job or a car or a deal or fear or guilt or whatever it is. And what we think is saving us, and we're holding on with dear life like the monkey was with the nut, could also be the thing that's leading to our own demise. Sometimes we have to have the courage to simply let go and adjust and adapt so we can live to fight another day. You've started something called the secret knock. Now, when people hear something like the secret knock, it sounds like uh, a very special place. You have to know somebody who knows somebody to get in. You have the secret knock, you get in. And once you get in, some very specialized, maybe ancient, maybe very secret information is revealed to you. Is that what's going on here? Okay. So I started secret knock as just a fluke, you know, 12 years ago. And now we're uh -huh. four Inc and entrepreneurs top listed event in the world for business leaders. And mm -hmm. the way it happened is I was interviewing all these amazing people for the Think and Grow It series. And people said, how can I meet your friends? So one day in my living room, I invited some of them and they said, well, just come to the house. And they go, well, how do I know it's your place? And I go, just do the secret knock. We'll let you in. It was just a joke. And it went on. They told their friends and told their friends. And now we grew into this mega juggernaut of a uh, business. And it's, it's pretty cool. So the next here in San Diego, and instead of just bringing in coaches and teachers and mentors, I bring the actual person who did what everyone else is talking about. 
So you actually learn right from the horse's mouth. Hmm. So when you get in, I mean, are the lights kind of dim? Are people wearing tuxedos? I mean, what, what kind of event is this? <laughs> eh, won't tell you. The, the way it works is this. To go, uh, you have to go to secretknock.co and apply. And then someone calls you to make sure that there's a good fit for everybody to even come. It's the strangest event in the world. It costs thousands of dollars to go. And we will not tell you where it is or who will be there. And once you register, then we'll tell you the city and the state and the area so you can get a hotel. And then we release the you know, location right before the event so we don't have people popping in. And the reason is we've had everyone from, you know, last time I had Presidente Vicente Fox come in from Mexico. I've had Tonino Lamborghini, Mr. Lamborghini flying from Italy. I did a private Skype with Edward Snowden while he's hiding in Russia, all the way to the founder of Showtime Television to you name it across the board. And the people that come in are literally the who's who and they don't just uh, want access to every person off the street. Interesting, because it's knowledge, but it's also access, isn't it? It's pure access. So there's no VIP rooms, there's no, everyone's treated the same. When you come to our event, you can leave your credit card and checkbook at your hotel room. It's not one of those type of events. What happens is literally you come out and you hang out with the people that most people are talking about, but you can have a talk with them over lunch and have a mentor like Frank Shankwitz, the founder of Make-A-Wish will be coming out and go, hey, tell me the story behind the story. Let me see your movie and how did that go? Did this really happen? So you have direct access to these people and that's what we like to uh, deliver. In closing, what, what is your message to people? What do you want people to know who are watching this um, as far as accessing parts of their parts of themselves inside that they may not have accessed before as far as even what they're capable of? What do you, what do you want them to know about themselves? Well, 80% of every single thing we need is already within our sphere of influence. I'm going to say it again. 80% of every single thing we need is already within our sphere of influence. Most people are just afraid because that judgment to reach out. I promise everyone watching this, you've got people that you met at some event, you put them in your phone, you met them at some networking thing and you're waiting for the perfect time to call them. Today's that day. Mm. I would just say, you pull out that phone and you reach out with specificity and say, I need 12.5 minutes of your time. I wanna to talk to you this one thing and you'll be amazed how accessible people are. And once you get that rhythm going, it's like siphoning, then it starts flowing and everything starts coming your direction. Can't beat that. That sounds like good advice. Yeah, it's the it's the action and law of attraction that makes your dreams come true. Think it, feel it, do it. Brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Greg Reed, for appearing here. And people should go where to what website to catch more of your information? Uh, you can just Google me, Greg Reed. I've got a bunch of sites, but if you want to secret knock, go to secretknock.co. But if you want to talk to me personally direct, just go to Instagram and direct message me at Greg S. Reed. My only request is this. I don't like to talk about the weather, what you ate for dinner, your kids. But if you got a direct business question or something that you could say, hey, do you got a connection or a lead or resource over here? What would you do? I'd be glad to answer that for you. And I'll do it myself. It doesn't go through a filter. If they're even smarter, they'll probably research you and find some need they could possibly fulfill for you. Like you say, like memes. Bring it on. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Greg. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.